Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Sister Dagan here with you again from Hope Apostolic in Florida. I hope all is doing well. I hope you're feeling blessed and highly favored of the Lord today. We are going to get into our podcast today, and we're going to continue on with our lesson about our relationship with Jesus. Amen. Before we get started, go ahead and grab your pen and your paper and your Bible And then let's join together in prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, for another day, Lord Jesus. I thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together in one mind, in one accord. Lord God, we ask, God, that you would go before us today, Lord God, that you would anoint these lips of clay, Lord God, and that your words would be funneled through me as a vessel, Lord God, for your honor, that I would hide behind the cross of glory today, Lord God. Anoint our heads, our minds, Lord God, to understand. Stand, Lord Jesus. Anoint our hearts to receive our souls, Lord God, to be impregnated with your word, Lord God. We thank you and we honor you, Lord God. I pray for the soil of our hearts today, Lord God, that it would be fertile, Lord God, and ready to receive your word, that we could grow stronger in you and the joy of our salvation, Lord God, and that we will have skills and strategies to go forth, Lord God, and to magnify you and serve you in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray and the church says amen amen that was good good job (laughs) all right today is so beautiful and I thank the Lord for this opportunity to be here the last time that we got together I started sharing with you some of the seeds that had been planted in my life for prayer prayer my connection with Jesus it's where the humanity meets and connects with with divinity amen and I, I want to be very mindful and purposeful about my relationship with Jesus. And so as I've gone through my life, as I shared, God had begun to put these points in my life. And just a recap of what we talked about last week, we talked about one, being available. Um, being available, meaning that we're answering the call, as it is in Isaiah 6 and 8, when Jesus said, or God said, whom shall I send or whom will go? Who will go? So making sure that we are available to go and to be with him. The second thing that I talked about the last time we got together is being purposeful in our relationship with Jesus to help that relationship grow. Seeking first the kingdom of God before anything else, before we do anything else, seeking first his kingdom, before we take any steps, before we make any decisions, before I move to a new city, I'm going to seek him first and I'm going to make sure that there is a place there, a hub, an ark that I can go to so that my soul can be saved. I do not understand and comprehend people making moves and major moves without first making sure that there is a sanctuary for them to worship at. That should be one of your first things that you do even before you would find a house or anything like that in my opinion. But being purposeful, acknowledging him in all that I do, loving him with all of my heart, soul, and my mind, being available and being purposeful about my relationship with Jesus. Amen. So that was step one and step two. Honestly, these are not in any specific order. These are just simply in the order that I was given, that they were given to me. The third thing that God spoke to me about is being mindful about my relationship with him. Being mindful, being conscious, aware of it, inclined or willing to do something, alert, aware of. So in other words, my relationship is a priority and Jesus is always on my mind. When you see me coming, I got Jesus on my mind. When you see me going, I got Jesus on my mind. Amen. I've got a song of praise in my heart. I've got peace like a river that runs through my soul. And Jesus, amen, is on my mind. Now, I have to tell you that I have the privilege to teach our door to core class. Door to core at our church is whenever new converts come in or or people come in from new areas when they move in and they want to get acclimated to a church, acclimated to church ministry, move into church leadership. And so I have the privilege to teach the door to core class. I have to tell you, I love to teach. I love to teach 
the door to core class because they're so hungry and they just suck up the word. Amen. And, and we're sitting in this room. It's a smaller room. But just even um, yesterday when I was teaching, our, we had nine in there, and it was so beautiful to see them. And I, I would stop and pause, and I would say, do you feel that? And, and you could feel just the presence of God just feeling that space. And so it's teaching them to flow in the spirit. It's so good if you are a mentor to make sure that you take opportunities to just kind of step back and teach those that you're mentoring or that you're pouring into about being sensitive. We need more people, not just people that are in the pulpit, but we need people that flow in the anointing in the pews and that are walking amongst us that are going out into the hedges and the highways, right? That are anointed and they can flow in the spirit. They can flow in the anointing. So I'm teaching them to flow the anointing. Now, let me get back to that. I might talk about that another day. So I'm talking about being mindful. The entire class, the entire concept of door decor is literally teaching um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and set through 17. It's teaching the basis of that entire class, I would say personally, is based off of that scripture. So let's write that down, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. We're talking about being mindful. So being mindful, um, I feel like today might be a little more teaching. Amen. I can feel that on me right now. So praise God. That means that we're going to go deeper into his word. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, the entire door to core class is based off of that. And what that scripture says is all scripture is given by inspiration of God, inspired by God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete Thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. And I'm going to kind of explain to you why I feel that way. This is the point that I'm trying to make is how we must be mindful about our relationship with God. And so for us to be mindful about our relationship with God, we have to be mindful and we must be cognizant. We must have an understanding of what his word says because his word, it's a light, right? It's that lamp. It's a lamp and it, it, it's, it's guiding me through this world. It's navigating me and it should, be, it should be what is pushing me and instructing me and helping me to find my way towards a closer relationship with Jesus. So let's break this scripture down a little bit. The word of God is so important. I've heard people say before that God just doesn't speak to me. I just, I, I just have never heard God speak to me. And, and I always admonish and encourage them when I hear those words. Well, when is the last time that you've picked up your Bible and you've read your Bible? And they're just, they look at me and they're like, well, I read my Bible all the time. Excellent. That's excellent. Guess what? Every time you pick up your Bible and you begin to read it, you are hearing specifically from God. And I can say that because I believe wholeheartedly that just like 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all scripture, all scripture, not just a few verses, not just some that we like to pick and choose as our favorite, but it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning that when these men of God went to sit down and they begin with their pen and they begin to pen these words out, it was just, it, it was a pushing, it was a burning within them. And then I can just envision and visualize that it was just burning within them to write these words down. And, and it was just like this ship that is, is in the ocean or in the Gulf. We live here next to the Gulf. And, and it's just, you see the waves come in and they can have all these anchors down and, and, and yeah, it, it'll hold it. But I can tell you, I have seen them before, especially during those hurricanes where it didn't matter how many anchors you had on there. When that water came in in a certain way, it was just pushed and it went where the water was telling it to go, that ship. So I would imagine that's how these men of God felt, that whenever the unction of the Holy Ghost came upon them, the unction of God's Spirit came and set upon them that they just felt driven and they just felt pushed to write. And they feverishly, all through the night, I can just see them through the night and through the day writing. So we must have it settled within our heart that every single word, every jot, every tittle, Every little piece, every little, every little point 
that is upon those the script, the, the holy role, the holy script, the role, right, is inspired by God so that I can learn how to live for him in a more excellent way. So inspired word of God, I'm so excited. I love this scripture so much because it's literally a roadmap for me. It's really instruction for me as I would envision Noah, how God had given him the instructions on how the ark specifically had to be built. This is what I feel like this scripture is for my life. It is literally step for step for step of how I can grow in my relationship with him. So here I have the word of God. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable meaning it's good every state every single jot and tittle it is good why is it good okay let's continue on are you looking second timothy 3 16 through 17 it's good for doctrine the doctrine teaching me what is right it's teaching me how to live more excellently it's teaching me how to get to heaven it's teaching me who jesus is doctrine Doctrine is the very first thing that's mentioned. I do believe that God gives things to you in order for a purpose, okay? So if I'm thinking about, he said doctrine first, and then I'm thinking about the armor of God in spiritual warfare. Before I can go forward in spiritual warfare, the very first thing that he gives us that has to be on properly is what is it do you remember the belt of truth exactly the belt of truth the belt of truth representing doctrine meaning that my doctrine must be right i must have a full understanding of who jesus is and that he is my propitiation that he is my salvation and that i can walk holy in him i can write i can walk righteously not in myself but in him because he is beautiful and he is excellent Understanding that doctrine, that my doctrine must be true and my doctrine must be right. Amen? So, first, it must be doctrine. If you think about the Roman armor that was put on, I do believe that there was a reason that Paul gave doctrine first. Obviously, God gave it to him. But do you recognize, if you were to study out in customs, that if the belt of truth, the belt, was not put on properly, then the rest of the armor would not fit right, meaning the breastplate of righteousness would not fit right over the belt of truth. So you must make sure that your doctrine is right. Titus 1 and 9 says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So I must have sound doctrine to exhort in truth, exhort him in all things, exhort lifting up holy hands and a clean heart, but then also so that I can compel them, those that would kick against the pricks, goats, those that would contradict. I can speak sound doctrine to them, not in an argumentative spirit, but in a spirit of love, because it's a spirit of love that draws, right? Continuing on. So, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, and I am talking about being mindful in my relationship with Jesus because for me to be mindful in my relationship with him, I must have sound doctrine. I must walk in truth. The second part of that scripture, it says it's profitable for doctrine. It's good for doctrine, but then also for reproof. Wow, reproof. That's an older word. We won't, don't hear that one a lot. But reproof is talking about you know, what's not right? What's wrong? What am I doing that's wrong? Well, the Bible tells me that we're all sinners, right? We're all shaping in iniquity. I have an understanding of that. I am only saved by grace. My righteousness is of filthy rags and I got, I'm still human. I feel that I'm still human and I am not perfect. What I tell my students in my door to court class, it's not perfection. Yes, we strive for towards perfection, but we are not there yet. And frankly, if we ever get there, I truly expect to be caught up in heaven immediately because there are none that are perfect that are walking amongst us, right? And so I know that I make mistakes and I have some thoughts sometimes that are wrong. And I may do some things sometime that are wrong. And that's what it's talking about. So it's profitable for doctrine, but it's profitable for reproof. 
for telling me what's wrong in my life. Did you know there is honor according to Proverbs for people that regard reproof? Those that appreciate when they're told they're wrong? It says, again in Proverbs, the one that regardeth reproof is prudent. The one that recognizes. So I'm learning that the scriptures, the word of God, because that's how I'm going to grow in my relationship with him, is by falling in love with his word because those are love letters to me, right? And I cling close to them, and I try to consume them. I eat them daily. I eat that scroll. So doctrine and reproof. So Tevita, these things are not right. But you know what I love so much about my heavenly father? It's wonderful. He doesn't just leave me there in my sin, does he? No. What is it? The song says he picks me up, turns me around, places my feet on solid ground. Yes, this is what's happening. So I have reproof telling me what's wrong. And then he tells me how to get right. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gives me the steps that I need on how to walk righteously towards him. Not in myself because my righteousness is filthy rags, but in him. Correction. How to get right. Jeremiah 7 and 28. It talks about when you don't receive correction, then truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. And I don't want that in my life. I want to know what I'm doing wrong. I want to be corrected. Davida, this is wrong. Davida, this is how you correct that. I want that in my life. I desire that. And that's why it's so important that we have voices that speak into, their, into our lives. I know that my husband and I, we are sitting here to pastor specifically in this area. We birthed this church that um, we're in right now um, out of our living room, literally out of our souls. It is our lifeblood, this church. And, and we love this church. We love this people. We love this area. And God has broken strongholds here. But I have to tell you, that we didn't, we, we didn't and we don't always do things right because why? We're not perfect. And so we need people, authorities in our life, that covering that we have in our life to speak to us sometime and tell us, you know, I, I appreciate everything you're doing, your zeal, but this was wrong. And this is how you would correct that. We all need it. That's how we grow. The next thing that I love so much about 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says that the scripture, the word of God is good. It's profitable for doctrine. We talked about that and for reproof, for correction. We talked about that. But the next thing it talks about is for instruction in righteousness. So here he does. He's, he's got that belt of truth. It's, it's established. And then I begin my progression in my walk with God. And he says, this is wrong. Okay. This is the correct way to do that. Okay. Now I need the instruction on how to stay right. How can I live a holy life? How can I live that righteous life? Remember my last time that we got together, we talked about my mirror that I have in my door decor class and how I have a picture of the world here. And then I have the cross and I have justification written on it and how John talked about faith. And then James come back and says, yes, it's your faith, but it's also your works. And then on the very opposite end of the spectrum from the world, you have this picture of heaven for glorification, right? I hope you're visualizing this. And I have a rope that is tied to both ends. And then on this heart, on this rope, I have put a pool noodle because it goes back and forth with this big heart that says sanctification and it's written on both sides. And so the purpose of the mirror is, is the process of sanctification, meaning that I have to continually reflect in my life and I have to measure myself, not according to myself and honestly, not according to my peers, understanding that I have those that have rule over me or that have my, are my covering that I listen to and that I would strive to be more like them, but I'm really going to be measured by the word of God. Amen. And so I must be mindful of the word of God. And so it's giving, it's good for instruction on how to be right. Amen. Uh, instruction in righteousness. 
Um, Proverbs 12 and 28, it says, in the way of righteousness is life. And that is what we're striving for, is to live abundantly in him, to grow in our relationship with him. Amen. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death, meaning that I will live eternally. So as I'm progressing in my walk with him, when I'm taking my life, when I say this is my life goals, this is the life, this is the creed, this is the thing that I live by, this is my scripture that that propels me forward, that makes me to be available, to be purposeful, but to be mindful of him is that I have established myself in the doctrine, meaning that I understand how I must get to heaven, right? I, there's only one way, and if any man comes any other way, he's a thief and right. So there you have it. So anyway, you go forward, and you're walking in the doctrine, and you have an understanding of who Jesus is. Obviously, he says, uh, me and my father, we are one, and that, and that, and then I'm thinking of Paul as he's on the road to Damascus and he has understood and has been given very directly a revelation of who Jesus is. He's, Lord, Lord, who art thou? And he says, I am Jesus whom thy persecutest, right? Remember him? He was Saul and, and he was the one that even held the cloak of Stephen who was stoned to death because he was a follower and he was a teacher of Jesus Christ. And wow, what an epiphany, what, what a realization, of who Jesus is. So understanding that Jesus is God and walking in truth and righteousness, uh, trying to, to be more like him and not being a Christian as, 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 the, as the world would call a Christian, but I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and so I must be mindful of that, walking in him and, and trying to mirror myself after him and after his word. So his word is telling me that it's good for doctrine and it's good to tell me what's wrong. It's good to tell me what I need to do to get right correct, how to be correct, and then the steps, the goals, the objectives that I need to take to become that and to walk in that. Amen. So I must be mindful and must remember that I am a sinner that is saved by grace and that I need him. I need his words to be victorious. I must be mindful that this word is needs to be alive in my life and that my feet must be planted up on the rock amen of Christ Jesus I must desire him and his word to be intimate with him I desire to go into the holy of holies but I must not be like that cake that is unturned I must be balanced in my relationship meaning it's not just all about the emotion I can't live in the place of Psalms because life is not just in the Psalms. We're doing a study right now. It's a book called Life Grid with my ladies in ministry that I mentor here in, the, in my church, the ones that are directly involved in ministry. And we're, we're studying the books of wisdom. And it's the neatest thing, this Life Grid. And um, I can't remember who wrote the book, but it's a workbook and it's amazing. I've enjoyed this study so much. But they talk about the Life Grid and it teaches you how the books of wisdom literally is that person in their life. And it talks about the doing of the person and the feeling of the person. And so literally going from Job and you're going all the way to Ecclesiastes and and then finding Psalms somewhere in the middle of that and the 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 crossroad of all that of that emotion and that feeling but it, it's the script this the word it's the books around there that's teaching us how to live victoriously and and how we have all of these life experiences before us so it's a beautiful study. So, but I desire to know him and for me to truly know him, I must study his word. I must eat the whole scroll and I must live it and I must walk it and I must be mindful of it so that I'm able to be mindful, amen, of him. Psalms 1, 
um, ver- chapter 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, how do you know if they're ungodly? Well, because I've been reading his word and their actions are not lining up with the word of God. So therefore, I know I don't need to walk with that person, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitting in the seat of the scornful, the one that's judging. So how do I know that? Because it's not lining up with the word of God. Do you see how you must know his word so that you can be mindful in your relationship with him? But his delight is in the law of the Lord. What is the law of the Lord? His delight is in the word of the Lord, in doctrine. It is delightful. You delight yourself in his word and you consume it and you eat it. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. You know, I love prayer because prayer is when my humanity can connect. It intertwines with divinity, the lover of my soul. And therefore, it says his delight is in the law of the Lord Amen. And in his law, doth he meditate his word? Do I meditate his word? Do I think upon? I am mindful of day and night and he shall be like a tree. It's a promise to me. It says, as I meditate upon his law, as I meditate upon his word, then he shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. Whatever I put my hands to do will prosper. Why? Because I am standing not in myself, praise God, but I am standing up on the word of God as I stand in him, as I, as I walk in him, as I meditate on him day and night, then I am like that tree that's planted by that river. Meaning, I am not going to be moved by the storms of life that come my way. Will I bend at times? Yes, absolutely. Because why? Because you are human, right? I am human and I have emotion and I have feeling and I get weary, but I have a promise in him. How do I know that promise? Because I am meditating on his word. How do I know what to meditate on? Because I have ensconced myself. I have consumed myself. I have eaten of the scroll of his word. I hope that I'm igniting within you a hunger to dig into that word and to know him. How do I know him? How do I know Jesus? How do I have a relationship with him? By knowing him, reading his words, words, love letters given to you straight from him. Praise Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your words. Amen. Psalms 19 and 14 continues and it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If I am speaking his word, then it'll be acceptable to him. Yesterday in my class, we were speaking about the word of God. And I stopped for a moment because as we begin to just talk about his goodness and We were talking about baptism and needing the Redeemer, right? We needing um, redemption and, and, oh, my goodness. And then I begin to talk about baptism or baptismals over there. But then I begin to talk about how when you go down into the water, yes, you put on the mind of Christ, but you go down into the water, and it looks like water to us, but in the spirit it signifies the blood. And when I go down into the blood, no more are my sins just pushed back from year to year, right, as the atonement But oh my goodness, it is redeemed, it is gone, it is remitted, meaning it's removed from me. And then as I go down into the water and I come back up, I'm not the same anymore. And I've put on the armor of light and I walk forward as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Praise God. How do I know that? Because the word of God says that. And as we begin to speak of that, and I have just felt that same mighty presence that come in here as I've been talking about that. Why? Because he's drawn to his words and he's drawn to, don't you love it when people encourage you? Don't you love it when they're talking about good things?
things. You're maybe a little bit embarrassing sometimes, but it feels good in your heart, right? Well, my goodness, when you begin to exhort and you're speaking out loud into the atmosphere and the atmosphere begins to change, he's drawn to your words and he's, he's drawn to hear more about his goodness and you begin to feel the change in your life. Amen. Psalms 104 and 34 says, My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. The word of God says to what? To taste and see that the Lord, he is good, that he is sweeter than the honeycomb. Oh, taste and see. Consume his word. Psalms 119 and 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. His words, remember, for reproof, telling me what's wrong, for correction, to tell me how to get correct, to tell me what needs to be corrected, right? And then instruction of how to stay right. So thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I want to be mindful of him in my life. When I walk outside these doors and I'm faced with difficult situations, I don't want to be consumed by my own lust and and my own will. I don't don't know about you, but anybody that knows me knows that I I am very strong-willed. God help me. And I recognize that. That can be a strength or it could be a weakness. It depends on how you have allowed yourself to be altered by Jesus. And what's leading you, what, what part of you has been, has been filled, the spiritual man or the physical man. I have a picture hanging up in my, my door to core class, and it's, it's that. It's a picture. Some of you maybe have seen it, but it's this man who's grotesquely obese, and, and it says physical, and then there's this little bitty emaciated man on the other side, and it's the spiritual man, and it has a pipe. And the little bitty spiritual man that's emaciated is just getting little bitty drops and this obese man is getting the gush, right? I don't want that to be that way in my life. So I must be willing to place myself upon the rock to be broken because the word of God says, see, this is why you need to know the word because you need to know what's going to happen if you don't follow after what the word says, right? Whatever you plant is what you're going to receive. Whatever you reap, you're going to sow it, right? And so I have to know that. And so it, I need my spiritual man to grow, and I need to be protected from whenever I'm in the storms of life. So I have to hide his word in my heart. Psalms 119 and 15 says that I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Psalms 119 and 97 says, oh, how love I thy law. You need to fall in love with it. It is my meditation all the day. If you haven't read Psalms 119, I encourage you to read it. I know it's the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's really good on helping to direct you and to lead you. But meditating on the Word of God so that I can be mindful when I'm walking on Him. Proverbs 4 and 20 through 22 says, My son, attend to my words. This is, this is Solomon. He's, speaking, he's talking to his son and he's saying, attend to my words. But it's, it's God speaking to us saying, attend, know my words. Incline thy ear into my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes and keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find it and health to all their flesh. When I follow after him, are you telling me, Sister Dagan, I'm never going to have, you know, bad things happen to me if I follow after him? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. And if you read the word of God, you will see this. But what I can tell you, that even when you're in that place that feels like bondage, even when you're in that, that, that Philippian jail, right, Paul? I have always joy because he's always with me. And he is my rock. He's my hiding place. So when the storms of life rage around me, I can go to that hiding place. I can go to the stone that builders rejected. He is my cornerstone. I can go to that place and abide in him through prayer and meditating upon him. Now, as I'm beginning to wind down a little bit today, I have something very specifically I want to talk to you about. Um, So please bear with me a little bit longer. Philippians 4 and 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, I'm talking about being mindful. So I have noticed in life that a lot of times our minds will begin to wander 
And I talked about this yesterday, that whenever you go down into the water and you have a new mind in Christ now and you're a new creature, you're walking in in Him, and all the old things, the old sins, the old ways have been remitted. They've been washed away. No more to be remembered, but forgiven. They're forgiven. But we, we remember. And Satan will come back to you, and he will try to put those thoughts back into your mind and condemn you because he is a condemner, right? Well, the Bible very specifically talks about your mind and how you must arrest your mind. You have to grab literally. It literally means in the Hebrew that you're grabbing a hold of it with your hands. You're grabbing it, arresting that mind. So Philippians 4 and 8 talks talks very specifically on what you should be thinking on. Please do not tell me you're a realist. I've used that argument myself. But being a realist... And walking wholly in the word of God does not work. It, it, it doesn't, they don't work together. Because either you walk in the righteousness and the hope of Christ Jesus, or you're walking in the reality of this world. I'm not saying that you are not aware of things that go, are going on, but my hope is in Christ Jesus, right? It's not in the, the horribleness or the destruction, the darkness of this world, but it is in the light of who Jesus is. So, so Philippians 4 and 8, I must arrest my mind, but Philippians 4 and 8 says, Finally, brethren, our sister, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We are to think on the things that are true. We are to think on things that are honest. We are to think on the things that are just and pure and lovely and are of a good report are of virtue and of praise. So that means that when our mind is beginning to go down that path that is negative, we must stop it. And we must think on things that are true, that are lovely, and that are of good report. Sister Dagan, these things happen to me, and I respect that everyone has had trauma and that everyone's had different experiences. But I have chosen in my life to be a victor. I am not a victim. I will not live in that place. I will grow beyond that place and I will grow into Christ Jesus because he is my strength and he is my shelter. He is my resting place. So when the darkness of life is pushing in, then I run to the rock because that's where my strength lies. Let's look at this for a minute. So it says for me to think on the things of truth, thinking on truth about God and his word. So I must ask myself, what is true? What is true about God and his word? When things are overwhelming me, I have to stop and say, remember, I talked about 2 2 Timothy 3 and 16, how I have to know doctrine and I have to know what's wrong and what's right and how to live that way. And as I'm digging through there and I'm seeing, it's teaching me how to live in Christ Jesus. So I have to think when I'm going through the storm, what would God say? What does his word say? So that I will have the answer. There's no new thing under the sun. Where did you hear that from? I heard it from the word of God. There's no new thing under the sun. So I know that I can walk victoriously regardless of the situation that's going on in my life. The foundation for a healthy thought life is in the word of God. What are you saying, Sister Dagan? I'm telling you that it's some of my darkest moments and some of my, some of my loneliest moments when I am driving down the road and the darkness is pushing in and I have physically had to grab a hold to my mind, meaning that it was pushing in so hard that I literally at the top of my lungs am screaming, Jesus, Jesus, to, to, to push out the words in my mind that I'm hearing and I'm just focusing on the name of Jesus. I I am singing songs in out loud and trying to change the atmosphere that's around me. I'm arresting my mind. I'm speaking out the word of God. That's why it's important for you to have a spiritual toolkit. Maybe I'll do a lesson on that, my spiritual toolkit. 
I need to have a spiritual toolkit that I have created so that I can live victorious. A, a Bible promise book where it has those scriptures, you know, when you need a scripture about love, when you need a scripture about anger, when you need a scripture about pride, when you need a scripture about depression, whatever it is, it gives you specific scriptures that you can go to and you can begin to read them out loud, changing the atmosphere, focusing your mind, arresting your mind to focus in on the word of God. Why? Because we have heard, we have discovered that the word of God, it is life and it is true. It is the light of my salvation. Amen. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. The reason I must arrest my mind is that I can live in perfect peace when I control my thoughts. This is the thing. I know I surely cannot be the only person that has done this. What if? Can everybody say that with me? What if? We must get out of the what ifs of our life. What if this? What if this were to happen? What if that were to happen? What if this were to happen? What if they die? What if they do this? What if this person comes here? What if? What if? What if? Nine times out of ten, those things, those what ifs never happen. And when they do, I have to wonder, did it happen because we spoke it into our lives? Because we know that life and death begins in the tongue. Hmm. What if? We must stop the what ifs in our life. The other thing that we love to say is, if only, if only this were to happen. If only this would not have happened. If only they would not have died. Or if only my life would be so much different. We must be so careful because when we live in the if onlys, when we live in the past, it changes our present and we don't even get to live the present that we're standing in today. We must understand that the what ifs of our future is the if onlys of our past, both based on on fantasy, robbing us of peace and joy of this present life that we're living in, that we are supposed to be living in today in his presence. Did you hear what I said? The what ifs and the if onlys are nothing but fantasy. And we must pray very specifically the word of God in our lives. Oh, I feel just settling in. A somberness of the spirit. Some of you right now need to arrest your mind and say, God, I want to live to your fullest this day. In this, I want to live in the present today and not of the if onlys of the future oh, and the only ifs of the past. How can I be mindful and cultivate the kind of thinking that leads to loving God with all of my mind? So that my relationship can flow in him. Very quickly, recognize the command that God is speaking in Philippians 4 and 8. Amen. What does it say? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, think on these things. What's happening right now? What's truth? What does the word of God say right now? I must recognize that command. And to think of things that are lovely, that are pure, that are just. Cultivating a mind to be mindful of Christ Jesus. Step two, I must respond in obedience to his word. I must keep it with all diligence. And I must understand that for the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal but mighty in God to the pulling down of stronghold, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, what does the word say? Thought. 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 And ca captivity, arresting. 
in the obedience of Christ. Understanding that I must be mindful and I must dig into his word so that I know how to be in the present and live victorious so that I can reap the benefits of following after him so that I can reap the benefits of being established in the doctrine so that I can know what I'm doing wrong so that I can be recorrected and I can what be instructed given steps on how to stay in his word how to stay in truth and righteousness so that I can be perfect one day and I can be equipped for every good work Proverbs 4 and 23 says to keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life to have a relationship with Jesus I must be available I must be purposeful and I must be mindful Sister Dagan that's all you talked about today was being mindful because if you can control your mind and you can arrest your mind it's the battlefield that you war with every day If you can arrest your thoughts, and I can control my thoughts to think on the things that are true, that are lovely, that are pure, that are just, and I can be obedient to the word of God, that I am promised a peaceful life, a life that is anchored in him, a life that is established upon his word, meaning that It is my roadmap on how to live as a victor and not the victim. I want to pray today. I want to pray very specifically. I wrote it down as I had was praying over this lesson. I wrote it down. And this was what I wanted to pray very specifically over. I want to pray very specifically over those that are still living in a life of fantasy meaning I've not been able to get past the past, meaning that I'm still finding myself day after day saying, if only. And then I'm so consumed with the future that I say, what if? That I forget that this is the day that he's given me just enough strength to get through till tomorrow and that as I hide myself in him he orders my step how does he order your steps what does the word say Sir Dagan why do you keep asking me that because I need you to get hungry for his word because that's where your strength lies his words it's your sustenance his word it's a lamp to my feet a light to my path his word let's pray Mm. Lord I thank you for your peace that I feel right now I thank you Lord for your anointing that I feel right now Lord Jesus wrap your arms around your people right now Lord God Lord Jesus, I pray over the soul today that it's living within the if only, if only this had not happened, if only I would have made a different choice, if only, if only. Release their minds, Lord God, in victory of thy word, Lord God, that they would find you as the present, the present help for today, Lord God. Oh, Jesus, help them, Lord God, to release, Lord God. Oh, God, Lord God, the one that's consumed with the future, Lord God, that they continually say, what if, what if, what if? And they forget, Lord God, that you give them help for today. And that there is joy in today, Lord God, for you are my salvation. Oh, I thank you, Lord God. Lord Jesus, for you are my daily bread. 
You are my strength and you are my light. You are my shield. You are my hiding place. Lord God, release a greater hunger in our lives, Lord God, for your word, Lord God, that we might walk, Lord God, with strength and with purpose, Lord God, that we may be mindful in you, Lord God, in all that we do, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I thank you for your word speaks, Lord God, that there's life and there's death in the tongue. Lord God, put a guard over my mouth, Lord God, that I would speak words of victory into my life, that I would speak words of victory into my family, that I would speak words of life into my family. I thank you and I honor you for you are good and you are a righteous God. You are just and you are merciful. Oh, you are beautiful. You are my friend. I thank you, my Jesus, and I love you this day. God bless you. May his face shine upon you. Go in peace, and I'll be with you again August or September for the next two steps of how to grow in my relationship with Jesus. Many blessings, my friends.